All right, so uh, the first part of this uh, PowerPoint is actually the second half of chapter five. So if you want to prepare yourself um, as you're reading back over your notes or your book, the second half of chapter five that starts with population ecology and then all of chapter eight is all you'd have to look at. So as far as amount of content, this is the least um, for any unit. Um, so population, all the individuals of a species that mm -hmm. can reproduce and make viable offspring. Um, we've already talked about this a couple times, so it's pretty straightforward. Size is the number. Nothing crazy here. Passenger pigeons, pretty cool. Um, I had a paleontology professor in college. We talked about passenger pigeons and their behavior. And was, I don't know if you knew this, but they were extremely populous. So, like they would be in flocks of millions and they would fly over and the sky would be black for like hours. And that's not a hyperbole. So um, it was kind of funny. The way that they reproduced was in kind of like large orgy-like settings. And so once they started being hunted and they got down below this critical level, they could no longer engage in their traditional kind of uh, reproductive acts. And they didn't know how to handle themselves, and so they all died. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so uh, I found that to be interesting. And my uh, paleontology professor was a pretty, uh, he was a pretty eccentric guy. So... Um, Shout out to him. Um, population density, you'll see some questions on this on your test. That's just going to be individuals per unit of area of land. And so that's typically going to be uh, either uh, hectares. Remember, a hectare is nothing more than 2.47 acres. Wouldn't matter. It would just be people per hectare. Or uh, kilometer squared or meter squared or something. So it's just going to be individuals divided by either hectares or individuals square. So you would just, you know, your big, your big uh, clue there about what you need to do is the question prompt will say, what is the population density in um, people per kilometer squared? And you know per means divide, so you just work it out, no big deal. Um, as far as the um, PowerPoint goes and things that you need to be ready to do on your test tomorrow, uh, the rule of 70 is not on the PowerPoint, but you certainly had to use it in your population math, right? So be ready to solve some problems with that. Remember, that's just 70 divided by the growth rate. Don't change it to a decimal, and that's your double in time and year. So make sure you look back over that. Anyway, population densities. Um, high densities have advantages and disadvantages. If it's very dense, easy to find mates, but you're going to be more um, uh, prone to competition. Um, and uh, increased transmission of disease. That's just good old like social studies from sixth grade, right? Like the plague was from crowded, unsanitary conditions. Um, low densities are good as far as finding resources, but it's hard to find mates. And so you have this positive, negative kind of situation going on where, um, you know, there's, there's positive and negative. Um, so population distribution, random, uniform, and clumped. This is not rocket science. Random is random. Clumped is um, in like schools like fish or flocks of birds or passenger pigeons. Um, <laughs> uniform. Uniform is going to be where they're equally uh, kind of spaced here uh, because they're having to share resources. Like trees will often do this so that they all have access to life. Uh, in this picture, the penguins are doing that so they all have like a good sized nesting area. So very easy. Sex ratio, um, that's just going to be males to females. One to one is going to be ideal in a monogamous species like humans um, because you need one boy and one girl. I don't need to give you like a sex ed lesson right now, but that's what we're all talking about. So a distribution or a structure, those are the population pyramids that we've been looking at the last couple days, um, and they kind of tell you the, um, the number of individuals in each cohort or age group. So um, survivorship curves, um, we have one, two, and three for your types. Um, and so if we look at that, type one is going to be your um, mammals, typically larger mammals. And they're going to, if you look at the data, what this is showing you is this is number of survivors out of a thousand. So if you look up here, that's a pretty high number of survivors per thousand. Like we take care of our young, right? And then we die when we're old in Florida. Um, <laughs> so type two, uh, because you have a, a continuous kind of constant slope there. Um, basically, birds and small mammals like rodents, they have some parental care, but um, they have sort of equal opportunity of death at any, any point. And then top three, you can see this really precipitous, whoops, precipitous drop here in um, survivors because they have a large number of offspring <coughs> and there's little parental care. But if you're like a frog and you make it to middle age, then you're, you know, going to be 
uh, a print soon and we'll look forward to it. <laughs> but um, so those are the three types of survivorship curves. Um, immigration with the eye, like coming in. So I think we already established that. People coming in, people exiting. If that confuses you, that should help. Um, <coughs> As far as births, like the neonatal unit at the hospital or the nativity scene at Christmas, this um, little group here means birth. So, natality is births, mortality is deaths. Um, and so, if we look at um, how to figure this stuff out, if you remember crude birth or crude death, that is per thousand, right? So, if we have a crude birth rate of six per thousand, then our actual percentage birth rate is 0.6%, right? Because we're going to divide the top of the fraction by 10. And the bottom of the fraction by 10 and get 100. If it was 6 per thousand, if we want a percent, the definition of percent is. I guess I should do that. That makes me feel better. Anyway, no. No, I meant to do the first. Can I? Look, I have that button. And that's what I was going. Um, so I have 0. 0.6 over 100, which is 0.6%. Bring it about for you. Okay, so if you have um, a crude birth or a crude death rate, if you're given a rate, if it already has a rate, you don't need to divide by that total population. It's already a rate. We, we find rates by dividing by total. Part divided by total um, times 100, or part divided by whole. So that's the biggest thing people make mistakes with. Um, so if we're looking at natural rate of population, it's going to include your births and deaths, but it's not going to include your migration. Migration meaning immigration. The I, and immigration with the E. Okay? Population growth rate, crude birth, and immigration. So all people come in, minus all people going out. And notice how it already says rate. It's not going to be divided by the total. It's already a rate. Um, and so that will give you in per thousand per year. If you need a percent, you would divide it by 10 because a thousand divided by 10 is 100. Um, so there, there is that information. Um, exponential growth. Exponential growth is going to be a J-shaped curve, so you're just going to start really low, and you're just going to go like that. So a J-shaped curve is exponential, um, and so this really is kind of rare. It only happens when you start with a small population. It only happens for a limited time. Um, you won't have much competition, ideal conditions. So this really is, um, it occurs with like a petri dish, and you're growing a culture of bacteria. There for a little while, that bacteria can grow exponentially because it has a lot of space, right? And then eventually, you'll run out of auger, that's A-G-A-R, that's the sugar at the bottom of a petri dish, like the kind of slime. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's sugar. That's what that is, the little substrate they use. Anyway, this will level off. And so now, instead of having a J-shaped curve, I have an S-shaped curve. And this is logistic growth. Exponential growth is if I don't have this part. Cool. Um, can't go on forever, though. Eventually, we'll reach some kind of carrying capacity. Um, so limited factors, the limited factors are what's going to bring you to your care and capacity. Can be space, food, water mates, suitable breeding site, temperature, disease, predators. Um, and so when I level off again, that's called the care and capacity. And it's just that maximum si uh, size that the environment can sustain. And, you know, when we did the um, tragedy of the commons lab, care and capacity was 16, and that was the most you could have in your lake. And so, you know, it kind of keeps coming back now. Um, that S-shaped curve is a logistic curve. How do you remember the difference between an S-shaped curve being logistic and a J-shaped curve being exponential? Well, it's pretty simple. The word logistic has an S in it. The word exponential does not. See? So S-shaped curve is logistic curve. And this is what we're going to see in an actual ecosystem. They can't go on forever in a J-shape. So if we look at what that looks like and consider um, those limited factors, here we see that we start in, with a period of that J-shaped exponential growth, and then it does level off, and we have an S-shaped curve. And so here's those limited factors, resources, predators, disease, etc. cetera. Um, Density-dependent factors. So tomorrow in your test, you do need to be able to identify density-dependent and density-independent. And so here's a very simple way to keep that straight. Density-independent are acts of God. Okay. I don't care if you have seven butterflies or 7,000 butterflies in an area. If there's a tornado coming and it tears up their little ecosystem, it didn't matter how many they were there, did it? It was the independent one. In. So if it's an act of God, it's density independent. Because it didn't matter about the density. It's independent of the density, you understand? Acts of God, density independent. If it's not an act of God, then it's density dependent. So that would be space, mates, disease. Very simple, right? Can you keep that straight? 
Okay. Um, so um, here we have a nice logistic growth curve, um, and this is some yeast cells. So if they were put into like a culture, like I said, for a while they would grow exponentially until they ran out of food or space. Um, not everything, you know, follows these curves. Uh, mites are um, our selected species. They have high reproductive rates. And so if they experience a disturbance in the uh, forest, no, I'm just kidding, in the ecosystem, their population can come back really quickly. And so, pretty erratic. And then here's reindeer, and you can see that they were doing quite well. And right here is where Santa Claus became popular, but no, seriously, they probably started getting hunted. And you can see their populations declined precipitously. Um, St. Paul reindeer. I just, it's a nice name for an animal. <laughs> Sorry, they all did now. Um, so, <laughs> environments are changing and technologies. Um, for humans, we're really good at increasing our caring capacity and, because we have technology. So. Of course, we're going to talk about that later. Um, so those those K-selected and R-selected. Just to kind of reiterate what we've already talked about, K-selected are like kangaroos, right? They have a few young, and they care for them in their little pouches. K-selected species don't have to be kangaroos. I'm just really talking about any organism that has few offspring at a time, cares for them, uh, takes a long time to mature, so long maturation. Um, so that means that, you know, you can't reproduce after three days. It would take, you know, 30 years, not, not 30 years, but, you know, 13, I don't know. Um, our selected species are like roaches. They have a lot of young at one time, little parental pair. Um, so why did we have the K and the R? What is that even about? K, I don't know if you know this, but like German doesn't use the letter C. Well, now you learned something today, didn't you? Um, so K in German, like the K T extinction, the word Cretaceous starts with a C, but in German it starts with a K. Anyway, K stands for carrying capacity. So K selected species are not named K for kangaroos, they're named for K because their population is going to level off at carrying capacity and remain pretty stable. Our selected species have a high uh, reproductive rate, okay? And so that's why they're named our selected species. So if you see the letter K or the letter R, you have to understand what that means, not just like roach bugs, okay? Um, so, and that's extremes. They're not, not everything falls into these two categories, but a lot of things do. So, biotic potential, if you see that, that means you have the, the a high life potential. You can have a lot of babies. That's really, if I wanted to make it simple for you, that's what that means. How are we feeling? Happy times? All right. Um, let me scooch this on down. Um, so let's answer these little quick questions at the end here. Um, which type of distribution is a result of competition between individuals? What do you have, Kobe? Yeah, and so they're going to space out, um, face, become evenly spaced to share resources. Um, so what does this graph show? Circles on a line? Uh, just kidding. Ashley, what you got? Yeah, so the effects of carrying capacity on growth. And so you can see here's the carrying capacity and the growth does slow down. Um, and so now we have China, yay. Um, so as of January 1, 2016, the one-child policy in China is now a two-child policy. And so um, the AP exam really likes to ask questions that are from last year's current events. So I uh, really expect to see some water pollution problems in Michigan on there, and I really expect to see uh, China and the one-child policy. They haven't asked a population question in like eight or nine years. Like it's overdue. Um, so human population is kind of where we're going with this because we just covered like biology basics. Um, so in 1970, uh, China was just coming out of a famine, uh, sort of um, stricken kind of situation where they had a lot of people starve to death. It was awful. And so before we sit here and like say, oh, it's terrible that they make you have an abortion or they aborted their female babies or um, you know, they're kidnapping people out of the countryside for wives. Like, that's, that makes us sad, but you have to understand that they took these measures to instate the one-child policy because their country was overcrowded and, you know, those people were starving to death, right? So they took measures and they were pretty drastic and quick and they worked. Maybe were they inhumane, but so it's starving to death. So it's really important when we look at these issues that you kind of ditch your cultural preferences and think about it from maybe their perspective. Crazy talk, right? Um, so anyway, one child policy, the growth rate plummeted, and now the policy is less strict, and now so it's even less strict. Now you have two children, right? Um, 
So because of the cultural preference for male children, there was a selective abortion of female uh, infants. And then there was um, some forced sterilizations. And then I did also tell you that you know the second child, when they had the one-child policy, did not receive all the same rights with the free education and uh, care. So um, there was fines involved. And some, uh, depending on the, the area you were in, there were some uh, sort of manipulative things done to, to force abortion or force sterilization. Um, so anyway, the issue now and the reason they have moved to the two child uh, from one child is because when you have a society have these elderly people, they're going to need social services um, and they're going to need health care. And so it is the working class people, those reproductive age people that, that are paying taxes. And so um, increasing the workforce was, you know, kind of needed. So there's a lot of propaganda in China with, um, you know, hey, everything's happy. Let's just have one baby and make it a girl. It'll be fun. The sun will rise on your dreams uh, or set on them. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the, the main issue, though, is we continue to see the world's population grow. It will peak at about 10 mi billion in about 2050, is that 99% um, of the next billion people, and that's I'm not making this statistic up, 99% of the next billion people in the world will actually be added to the developing countries that cannot support them. Um, and so poorer nations tend to, have, um, tend to have the highest growth rates. And so, I mean, we've talked about some of those factors, but we're, you know, going to get that. Uh, India's growth rate is um, continuing, and it's it's going to um, surpass China's population in the next decade. They'll actually have more people than China. So um, if that's a race, they're going to win. Oh, okay. Um, so here's a nice picture. Um, so like I said, in the next decade, um, India will surpass China um, and to continue to grow, where China's population is pretty stable now, and it will start to shrink. Um, so kind of scary. Uh, population grows about 70 million each year and so um, when this PowerPoint was made and I think when I made your test um, <laughs> the population was 7 billion at 7.4 billion now yeah um, so that's fun and so we've added the most recent billion people in the last 12 years just do that math so humans or hominids humans and human ancestors have been around for like 2 million years and it took us two billion years up until 1800 to get to a billion, and then we've gone six and a half billion more people since 1800. So it's very much a, we're at a logistic, oh, excuse me, we're still exponential. We haven't hit our carry capacity, but it will happen in your lifetime right as you're in the prime of your life. So I wish you well with the retirement, and I wish myself well too. Um, <laughs> so anyway, if the growth rate is 1.2%, um, and so check this out. Um, if it didn't tell us how often the population would double, you can figure that out, right? Because 70 divided by 1.2 is equal to 58.3. So you feel okay about that. And if also if it had said that the population doubles every 58.3 years, you could also solve for x. Yes. So you'd be prepared to do that tomorrow. Um, just little reminders. Um, so if we look at that really beautiful J-shaped curve. Um, and so we could go, it took us uh, until 1800 to get to a billion. And so if we zoom in, you can see that we're very much still um, thrown at a fast rate here. Um, and so where is this growth happening? It's mostly happening in the developing countries, um, particularly those in Africa, uh, Asia, and South America. Uh, Africa being the fastest growth rate um, because they're the poorest countries. And so like I said, it's kind of counterintuitive that the poorest countries would have the highest growth rates, but poverty and um, patriarchal societies where women don't have educational opportunities, they really go hand in hand because you've taken half of your population and you've restricted them from the economy. Um, so, anyway, uh, what's happened is um, with our increased population growth is that we, um, as a global society, we don't like to die, okay? And so people are real into like not dying. So we're real, <laughs> yeah. And so we're we're big fans of taking technology and growing more food and figuring out, hey, it's probably a good time you know, to wash our hands and do immunizations. Uh, those kind of things that keep people, from, immunizations are actually a thing, by the way, um, that they actually work. Anybody got polio? No? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> get me started. Um, <laughs> sorry. So those things are dropping the death rate, great. So, 
Um, it turns out that people are cool with like washing their hands and having dinner before they're cool with like women going to school and having birth control. And so we're still at the point as a world overall where the death rates have dropped, but the birth rates are still high because of um, opportunities available to women. So um, population growth traditionally was seen as good because you needed support for the elderly. There was not Social Security. There was not retirement plans. Okay, so you need people to take care of you in your old age. And you need a large labor pool because a lot of society up until, you know, the last two, three hundred years was subsistence based where you farmed your own land and fed your family. And so you needed kids to like work on the farm. So um, it wasn't until right at 1800 where we hit a billion people that Thomas Malthus um, kind of came out and said, hey, you guys, all these people is not so good because uh, we're going to outstrip food supplies and war and disease and starvation. It's going to reduce population. I have a song about him. I wrote one here. Okay. Um, Malthus was an economist man. He said, what I really need is to stop having so many kids that won't get diseases. Okay. Um, so here's, <laughs> here's Thomas Malthus and here's Paul Ehrlich. He wrote the population bomb in like 1968 and he was called a neo-Malthusian. Neo means new and Malthusian was all obviously referring to him. Um, that's on this next slide. Sorry, I've ruined the fun for you. Um, anyway. As we have more people, we kind of obviously will have problems with less space and food and wealth per person. Um, so here's a giant graph I'm not trying to talk about. Um, as far as international um, kind of opinions on birth rate, most European countries, about two-thirds of them, feel like their birth rate's too low, and about half of countries not in Europe feel like their birth rate is too high. Um, and, and then again, for the, like the third time in the last five minutes, growth is correlated with poverty not wealth, okay? Um, strong rich nations have low growth rates because they have better education systems, and it really takes a lot of money to, to raise children in an affluent society. You gotta send them to school, they gotta have soccer, <coughs> wanna play the piano, and they wanna like, you know, eat pizza rolls, and so that's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> wait, pizza rolls in my advisement yesterday. I was like, no. Um, I pat, so remember you can pat your eyeball. Actually, close your eye first, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> IPATs. Um, so the IPAT model is environmental impact is equal to um, population. So just one part of this is actually the number of people we have times affluence, that's how much money you have, times technology, and then cultural, not cultural, excuse me, environmental sensitivity. So what that means is somewhere like a tundra area where you have low precipitation rates, pretty dry, and uh, the environment is not very resilient, you know, your environmental impact is going to be worse in those areas. So Sub-Saharan Africa, where they're in a, in a kind of savanna sort of situation where there's a, you know, not a whole lot of vegetation as far as trees. They're starting to deforest that area, um, kind of the chaparral too is very prone to this. And so then you have erosion and it's not going to grow back, vegetation is not going to grow back very quickly because it's so dry. And so um, unfortunately a lot of places that we have high population growth rates are sensitive um, as far as the ecosystem that's there. No worries though, right? Everything's fine. It's totally fine. So there's your nice little formula. Um, you don't actually ever put numbers into that. I'm just going to spoil that for you. Um, so as far as humans, we're using 25% of the Earth's net primary production. So net meaning after the plants get done, doing respiration. Remember this? Okay. Um, and so that's obviously through agriculture and then us feeding our livestock. Um, so technology has really increased our agricultural production. It's what's led us to, to be able to be at seven and a half billion people. Um, and the, so now we have this problem with these developing countries and they're starting to become more affluent and then they wanted to be like us because we're so cool. It's a terrible idea. Um, because we're so happy. Never mind, we're not. Um, and so as these developing countries want to become more affluent, that'll be good because their birth rates will go down and their population will go down. But then what is our ecological footprint compared to theirs? Scary. Um, I find demography to be extremely interesting. I took a, a human geography class, a, a demography class in college before I even knew I was going to teach this. We learned about population pyramids. It was like the coolest class ever. And then my professor was the one from Canada that had gotten paid to have four kids. So it was like a lesson in a lesson. I was <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, studying humans and how um, we have raised our care capacity through technology and all these population principles, that's demography and size, age structure, sex ratio, density, distribution, all these things. So I think this would be a cool job, by the way. Um, 
but I don't get out much. So here, pop, most populous countries, uh, China, India, United States, and then Indonesia. We already talked about that. You should already know it. How you feeling? Okay, good. Um, and if, <laughs> this is terrifying. If we keep our fertility constant, we'll be at a whole um, 26 billion by 2100. Anybody planning on living 83 more years? Just let me know how it goes. I don't think I, nope, I might not live 83 more years, but you might. You would love to be 100. You would be really crowded. Um, um, our population growth rate, um, fertility, shouldn't stay the same. It's kind of impossible for it to. Um, size doesn't tell the whole story. It turns out that we are not uniformly distributed as people. Like, we're clumped. If we were a fish, we'd be in a school. We actually are in a school, but we're not fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm on fire. Um, <laughs> so, if we look at this... Um, and you can see that um, as far as where people live, they, uh, if I draw the equator above the fat part of Brazil, that's my fancy way of saying it, um, we have people mostly in tropical and subtropical areas and temperate areas. And so here's the east coast of the United States. There's the, the Rockies. We're like, no, I don't feel like going over there. This is just like how America is. Um, and so India is very crowded. Here's the Himalayas, and we have the Gobi Desert going on. Australia is just a big desert. It's at 30 degrees south latitude. 30 degrees is kind of like, hey, here's a desert. Um, so, yeah, here's rainforest. There's like that one tribe that lives right there. I'm kidding. Um, so you can kind of see that we're, we're really very clumped along coastlines and then in, in pretty nice uh, climates. Um, a structure diagrams. We're going to look at those. There's five or six questions based on these pyramids tomorrow, which I hope you feel okay with now. Um, a structure describes the relative numbers in each cohort within a population. You cannot ever get away with saying that the, the bottom of the pyramid looks like a pyramid. And so since it has a wide bottom, then it's going to have pop. Well, no, you have to say that the pre-reproductive cohorts are larger in number than the reproductive cohorts. So the total fertility rate is higher than replacement. Like those are the things you have to say. So as you're studying for your FRQ, like I'm pretty sure that's one of them. It has population pyramids. Make sure you watch how you say things. Um, anyway, so an even age distribution, that's where we have um, the same number of individuals in each cohort until, I mean, once you hit 60, they're all going to go down because people do die eventually. Um, we can tell that that's going to be steady. So what I was just trying to tell you is here, you know, once you hit 70 or 80, they're all going to decrease because people do die. Um, but this is stable. This is increasing rapidly. Let me say it to you one more time. How to say the things. The pre-reproductive cohorts are larger in size than the reproductive cohorts, which indicates that um, the population is above uh, replacement um, as far as fertility. And when I say replacement fertility, that means that these people are having the just enough children to replace themselves. Okay. Um, here with decreasing, I can see that the Pre-reproductive age is lower than the reproductive age cohorts, so um, the people of reproductive age in this country actually have a, a lower fertility than needed to replace themselves. Can you say the magic words? Okay, good. Um, so here's Canada in 2012, um, and you can tell what my professor was paid to have children, right? Um, Canada has uh, a, 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 a negative population growth rate. Um, and so here's Nigeria. Um, I don't think they're paying anybody to have kids. It would look like that, but <laughs> uh, this is um, this is quite uh, drastic. And you can tell too. Uh, you can get information about quality of life as far as um, we can see. The age expectancy here is really starts to decline uh, pretty steadily after 50, 40, 50. Yeah. So uh, that's not really happening in these other pyramids until 60 or 70. Kind of see what I'm talking about. So it's not only just growth, growth you can look at, you can kind of get some details on life expectancy as well. All right, so populations are getting older. The average median, okay, uh, global age right now is 28. And it will be 38 by 2050, which is good. But elderly need care and financial assistance. So even if we slow down our growth and start having so many kids, who's going to take care of these people in their old age? Mm, okay. Um, Fewer dependent children. Children do cost a lot of money. School costs money. And then just typical deviant youthhood, like, that costs money and as far as crime. So, um, anyway, uh, China is, is changing. Um, in 1970, when they started um, the one-child policy, the average age was 20, and now, uh, or by 2050, it would be 45. So, that's, this is terrifying. The, the whole population of the United States in China... Like that many people in China will be over 65. 
in 2015. So they're going to have quite a, um, a, a a financial burden to bear. And so I really feel like that's why they, you know, say, okay, well, I guess you can have two kids now. So anyway, um, the number of people, uh, 15 to 64, um, as we go through, that's going to go up. Right, so this bar is showing us that the number of older people is going to go up, and then um, the number of people that are 15 to 64 is uh, for each of them is going down. So you have this this red line shows like basically productive members of society, 15 to 64, and then the people that are 65 and up are going to be going up each year, or each 25 years. Or I don't know about the scale of this graph making me question my life, but um, whatever you want to do, textbook, <laughs> I like every 50, 12, never mind, I give up. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the actual population pyramid for China. And so I really like this, because you can see, um, you can see the um, idea of population momentum quite well. So check it out. Um, if they started there, if this was from 2012, Okay, and they started their one child policy in 1970, then we would expect to see um, a decline in fertility about around uh, the co cohort of 40 years old. So we find 40 years old, and then, I mean, immediately you see the decline. Can y'all see that? So this is where the policy started, and then um, we, we start to see the decline in the number of people, right? Um, so, well, then what's this about? See this little. What this is called is like a, it's like a baby boom. Um, in the United States and European countries and Canada, where they, per, well, I don't know if Canada was really as much with World War II, but um, European countries in the United States, we have a, a baby boom around this time, post World War II. And then you have what's called the echo boom. So you have this little, last little bit of people that were born before the one child policy started, and this is their children if you go down 20 more years. And so even though at this point they were like, no more than one kid, you still have that increase in population growth once those people become fertile. And so that's, that's the idea of population momentum. And so you still see this, you can actually kind of follow it one more time, but it comes smaller. Um, actually, it's not there because I don't have one kid, so two. But you can kind of see that it takes a few generations before you actually stabilize the base of your pyramid and you really do see that negative growth. So um, we can be, just be happy. I, I don't know what they're doing. They look so happy though. Just chilling out. Like it's great to be in China. Um, I don't know. I can imagine a photographer going up to them and be like, can I take your picture? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to actually take a little break here, stop talking for a minute, and pause my little movie, which I hope is still going. Yay! Okay, so sex ratios sounds like fun math, but it's not. Um, <laughs> um, so unequal sex ratios can impact population growth, and so uh, human sex ratios uh, at birth slightly favor males. Um, so 100 males, excuse me, 106 males for every 100 females. But in China, there was 120 boys for every 100 girls, and so that was from cultural preferences. And like I said, it caused problems that like we had talked about before I started the lecture with uh, kidnapping um, girls from the countryside, increased risk of HIV because you have increased promiscuity because you have uh, um, you don't have enough females to have monogamous relationships with every male to understand so um, that's the issue there and so you have a lot of single people and that's just uh, the situation currently so whether population grows or shrinks gonna depend on a lot of stuff birth death immigration immigration and then technology so um, if we look here again for the Third time today, the least developed countries have the highest population growth rates. Um, the most developed countries um, actually have the lowest growth rate. So, you know, people are getting added to the areas that cannot support them. And um, by 2015, which we can already answer this question because it is now currently 2017, uh, we are at 7.5 billion. So, um, that graph is pretty accurate as far as continuing on. Now, TFR, sometimes they'll give you those letters and they'll tell you what they mean. So you have to know what it means. So TFR is total fertility rate. It's the average number of children that each woman in a society or country or area or whatever is having. So it's basically how many babies is each lady making. Like, that's it. Like you just need, like, an easy definition. Um, now, as far as replacement fertility, that's different. In a developed country, notice I'm not saying first world and third world and stuff like that. That makes us feel like we're winning, but we're not, you know, we're really not. Um, so, um, 
In a developed country, the replacement fertility is the number of children to replace um, the parents. And so it's 2.1. You would think it would be 2, but the 0.1 is an average. It's because it is an average, and it comes from the fact that some people don't choose to have kids, or they're infertile, or they don't survive to adulthood, or whatever. Um, and so your TFR has to equal the replacement fertility in order for the population to be stable. The replacement fertility in developing countries, developing countries, is around 2.6. And the reason um, it's higher is because you're going to have problems with infant mortality because of lack of medical care for the, the mothers. You're going to have problems with um, clean drinking water, childhood diseases um, due to dysentery, um, just simple things that um, immunizations can fix. Stuff like that. Um, so TFR has been decreasing in a lot of countries because of the increased uh, women's rights, industrialization. Living in an industrial society, like I already told you, is more expensive. So um, people choose to have less kids because they have to pay for childcare as they work, for example. Um, so in Europe, <coughs> TFR is currently uh, 1.6. So that's much lower than the uh, TFR needed to, you know, keep the population stable. Um, so. Um, if we look at that, it's, uh, you can tell that the, the places that could support the children really are not having any. The TFR in Africa as a whole continent, Africa's not a country, don't be that kid. Okay, good job. Um, it's 4.7. Australia's in the South Pacific. The South Pacific is what is bringing up this average, by the way. Okay, um, two and a half. Uh, Latin America, 2.2. Asia is 2.2. Um, China is bringing down this average, yeah? So, um, North America, 1.9. This number's being brought down by Canada. Um, and then Europe is 1.6. So, you can see a big difference there. Um, life expectancy is a good way to tell um, the overall quality of life in an area. It's the average age, you know, that you're likely to live. And it does include the statistics from infant mortality. Remember, infant mortality is death before the age of five. So, if you die when you're three, then that is obviously going to, when you average together, bring down the life expectancy in an area. So the demographic transition, um, I'm actually going to draw this, and I'm going to explain it to you as I draw it because it makes it easier to understand. So it's, it's a model of cultural and economic change, and there's four stages, okay? So, oh, look, I already drew it. Never mind. No, I'm just going to start over. Um, that's kind of sad. It's like, let me do it again. Um, so I'm going to make the black line be the death rate because that's just our cultural preferences, and then I'll make blue be the birth rate. Because boys are better than girls. I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> traditionally, if we go back in time, um, before the Industrial Revolution, maybe even before the Agricultural Revolution, birth rates and death rates were both high. Now, if they're both high, is the population going to grow? Yeah, because you have a lot of people who are born, but people aren't living very long, and your death rate is, you know, equally. So if I draw these out, I have a high birth rate and I have a high death rate. If they're equal, right, no growth here. And so for most of human society's history, like that's, that's where it work. Now, I already told you that people will be more apt to, like, washing their hands and having enough food um, before they will give women rights, education, and contraception. Like, that goes first. And so our ability to find diseases, increase sanitation, increase technology to make more food um, is going to be the first change that happens. So we have four stages. The first... Ooh. The first stage that I have drawn here is the pre-industrial. The birth rate and the death rate are both high. This one's high and this one's high. So they're both high and they're equal. Um, so if the death rate starts to drop because, let me put this back. So the death rate starts to drop. It'll drop very quickly. Um, like I said, we're not big fans of death. Um, the birth rate will stay high, though. So now we have a lot of people being born, but people aren't dying so much. And so this gap here, this is where we experience growth. So all this gap are people getting added to the population. And it's quick. It's very fast. This is where countries like Nigeria occur. They're starting to drop their um, death rate because they started to have access to medical care and better agricultural practices. The birth rate is still very high. And so um, this is the um, transitional.
we had them both high, the birth rate dropped. What do you think is going to drop now? Oh, the death rate dropped. What's, what's next? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's really easy to kind of divide these up. I mean, it's very common sense. So the industrial phase of the demographic transition starts when the death rate drops. The birth rate is going to stay low. And when they meet, they fall in love and get married. Just kidding. Uh, but no, they reunite here. And so we see that during this period, women start to have access to educational opportunities because the society is um, industrializing and urbanizing before moving to the city. The cost of having children is too expensive to have more than a couple, uh, and then they're no longer needed for subsistence agriculture. So that's why your birth rate is going to drop for all those reasons. And a lot of that, again, goes back to women. Um, so once they meet and they're now both low, we have entered into the post-industrial. And the birth rate can actually get lower than the death rate, which is what's happening in Europe and Japan. So anyway, this is the industrial. And birth rate's going to slow as the birth rate declines. And once they meet, that's post-industrial. So if you can remember that they both start high, people quit dying before they give women's rights to them. And they both in low, you should be good. Pretty straightforward, right? All right. So um, the biggest question you're going to see like, on the AP exam is um, during which phase. And they'll have one, two, three, four, or they'll have the words. It just depends on who's writing the question. Um, what, during what phase do you see the biggest growth? And so it would be phase or stage two, the, the transition. Okay. Um, so there's that. Um, and that's called the demographic transition. Here is their picture, which maybe looks slightly better than mine, but um, similar. So both high, death drops, birth drops, both low. Done. The end. Um, Pre-industrial transition. I just explained all this, and I explained it better than this, so I'm moving on with my life. Um, fertility in a given society, women, women, affluence, child labor, retirees. Oh, okay, this is very straightforward. I already talked about it. Um, family planning can include birth control, contraception, all this is on here. Um, efforts to control the number and spacing of children is going to be the greatest single factor in slowing population growth. So, um, clinics to offer advice, information, contraceptions, uh, contraceptives, wow. Um, rates of contraceptive use um, vary from 10% in uh, some areas in Africa, that's not from many, um, to 84% in China. Okay, and so China has free contraception. You don't, I mean, it's just really widely available and it costs you nothing. And so they see it as a good investment in their future as a country because um, the cost of a condom is much less than the cost of like a kid, uh, turns out. So um, just mm -hmm. simple math there. Um, low, low use of family planning has different causes. Um, so rural areas may not have uh, available availability. So we saw in uh, that, that, film that I started showing you about the woman in Ethiopia that had to walk uh, to the capital. Oh, is it Addis Ababa? Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, the country of Ethiopia has less obstetricians than, you know, Metro Atlanta, and they have 70 billion pe million people. Ooh, Ethiopia grow really quick there. Um, so they may not have avail that available to them. And then also some religions um, may reject family planning. So um, certainly some people that practice Catholicism don't, like we saw in the documentary, they don't choose to use contraception. Or it could be um, that the larger society as a whole um, just forbid women from making those decisions. Um, so anyway, this is the creepiest picture I've ever seen in my life. All these little gray babies are the babies that didn't happen. Um, but this this diagram that I refuse to look at is <laughs> so creepy. <laughs> so this could be like common core math for like four, eight, twelve. I'm just kidding. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, so this shows the woman's reproductive um, um, uh, window and basically her biotic potential, going back to that word I told you about a minute ago. And so having contraception really um, lowers the amount of children you have because it closes down that window and it, okay, just the not 
This, uh, okay, next. Um, <laughs> I can't even. Um, so, education to people, especially in rural areas. I mean, you saw in our documentary how people really didn't think that birth control was effective or it was available or they didn't think that their spouse would approve of it. And so, there's these community-based educational programs in countries like Thailand that have done really good jobs of reducing growth rates. Um, 2.3%, so you're looking at a population doubling every, you know, 20, 30 years, 25 26.67, is that it? I'm just kidding. Uh, somebody do the math. Um, and to what, 70 divided by 0.5 is 140. And if that's like witchcraft that I just did that math that fast, you know, half of uh, 1 times 2 is 140. No? Okay, never mind. Um, anyway, we've seen that uh, Mexico's population pyramid um, is pretty... Um, stable and we can tell that the cohorts of the pre-reproductive age are similar to those of the reproductive age. We saw that yesterday in our population pyramid activity um, and so they have these um, active programs for uh, community education and um, the how to use contraception. So um, you can see in this diagram that what they've done is they have um, as far as culture and location they've paired up countries. Uh, the country in blue um, was the country that had community-based education programs to um, show and, you know, um, tell people about how contraception works and, and its value and made it available to them. So Kenya and Malawi, you can see that, you know, Kenya's population shrunk more than Malawi's. Um, Iran, Bangladesh, and Dominican Republic, they all had, you know, similar things. And then Dominican Republic really, their, t their TFR went from, you know, six, almost seven to, you know, 2.2, 2.3, so right up replacement fertility. I mean, that's that's impressive. Um, that's just, you know, over 50 years, so. Anyway, um, I think we get the idea about women, and when women can decide how many children to have, um, they're going to be better cared for, healthier, and better educated. Uh, and so fertility rates are going to drop when women gain access to contraceptives and family planning. Um, so when women have educational opportunities, fertility rates is are going to decline because women are now becoming uh, active participants in the economy and childcare is expensive. Trust me on that mm -hmm. one. Um, and so you can really see this really um, well here and we just kind of draw a line there. Um, this is female secondary school enrollment rates and so Ethiopia it's always about 5% and so the TFR is 6.7 in Ethiopia. And so if we go up here um, to Jamaica um, where you know we have about 80% of um, girls in school, your TFR is closer to, you know, 2.3, So, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's very clear um, how those things are, are correlated. Um, and so, if you have uh, lower TFRs at higher for t um, secondary school enrollment rates, then those are negatively correlated, right, or indirectly correlated. You know, this is how those do math. Okay. Math class. Can you tell I like math? Well, uh, it's helpful to know how math works. Poor societies, higher population growth rates. Okay, More affluent societies have better health care, and so these things are uh, helpful to uh, drop in the birth rate and the death rate. So um, here we can see the affluent countries. Um, if we, this is mo, mo, mo money, mo money, lower population growth rate, and so we're going to have that negative slope again, which shows us that they're indirectly you know, related again. So um, kind of terrifying. Um, poverty exacerbates population growth. I've already talked about this. That makes four times. Um, population growth rate in these poor countries in, in, increases environmental degradation, um, especially in arid areas. Where you, you have, if you have deforestation, you're going to have trouble growing that vegetation back. So poor people cut corn, deplete biodiversity, and hunt endangered species. You know, we get, well, they're, you know, they're taking people on lion hunts. So poor lion. I'm sorry. If you had 6.7 children, and there was a line in your backyard, I bet you would go hunt it so you could feed your kids. Don't you think? Yeah. So, like I said, when you look at these international issues, you really have to ditch your personal perspective and kind of take a mile in their shoes. Wait, they don't have any. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, developing countries, again, their growth rate is a lot. Okay? Um, developed countries, not growing. 99% of the next billion people will be added to countries that cannot support them. All right, so affluent societies have enormous resource consumption, okay? One American has the ecological footprint of eight Indians, okay? So we can sit here and be like, well, um, if you do the math, 
Eight times 300 million is 2.4 billion. <coughs> What's the population of India? 1.2 billion. So is our footprint larger than India, even though they have more people? Yeah, by a lot. By twice as much, even though we don't have as many people. So population in and of itself is not the whole, the whole issue. So, all right, um, here you can see that graphically a, a family in the United States. I hope they had somebody help them take everything they owned outside. Yeah, the neighbors will come over and want to know if there was a dollar sale. Y'all know they did. How much for the couch? Um, <laughs> and there's the average Indian family and what they have. I just, I don't know. Um, AIDS is kind of perplexing, and that I means obviously, you know, tragic and, you know, not good things. Um, but the AIDS epidemic is, is having quite an impact on population. And so when I t showed you the demographic transition, the first thing that drops is death rate. Well, guess what? If your country has an AIDS uh, epidemic going on. In some areas, one in three people have AIDS or HIV, one in three, okay? So that is killing a large portion of the people. And in some developing countries, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the, the life expectancy is in the upper 30s, low 40s now. Like instead of being in like the United States, maybe 70s, low 80s um, in some countries, it's in the 30s and 40s because of AIDS. Um, and so if we have to drop the death rate before we can drop the birth rate, but they can't drop the death rate because they have AIDS, right? And so these problems just keep getting exacerbated. Um, the reason this is an issue, low rates of contraceptive use because of the patriarchy society, but then also um, infant mortality rate is, is higher. Again, can't get that drop de birth rate to drop. And so um, the, the life expectancy, and like I said, in some countries, in some areas, it's less than 40 for life expectancy now. And this goes back to um, some kind of, cultural myths in some areas. I have a friend that um, she works for the CDC and she did some work. She actually got malaria when she was in Malawi. This works both start with MAL, but whatever. Um, she was telling me that they have, um, and I think it's in the, the um, half the sky too, there's this cultural belief that if you have sex with a virgin, then you can't have AIDS. And so you have this just rampant rape of children, um, even really, really young children. And this that obviously doesn't work. And so then you have AIDS um, infected children as well. And these countries, they can't afford the medicine for the people. And the people in a country, if you think about it, this is deep, right? Um, the people in a country that are really the tax base that are that are working to contribute to the economy are the people that are of sexual activity, right? Age, like sexually active age. So those people are the ones that have AIDS, and so they're dead, or they're dying, or they're sick, or a lot of them are. And so you can't grow your economy and take care of the children and take care of the sick because the people that should be providing for your tax base are sick. See? So that's called demographic fatigue, which I feel like is on the next slide or two. I have a tendency to do that. Let me explain everything before I get to it. So the number of people with HIV is actually going, newly infected people is going down, but yeah. Demographic fatigue is when governments face overwhelming challenges related to population growth. Um, and so, like I said, uh, that, that, is it, that is the issue there because um, the cost of medical treatment is huge for um, Demographic fatigue is also relevant to China because they have such an aging population and they had to cut their birth rate so much. So that's another example. It doesn't have to be AIDS related. Um, so let's go over these last couple questions. What has accounted for the world, most of the world's population growth in recent years? Um, what you got, Jordan? Yeah, technology, medicine, and food. And so the death rate, right, that's internationally kind of where we are. Death rates are down, birth rates are still up in some areas. According to the IPATS formula, what would happen if China's one billion people had the lifestyle of that of Americans? We should just all um, cry. Lauren, what you got? Well, um, the population affluence actually lowers population. So um, maybe is there a better choice? Yeah, yeah. So their affluence in technology would increase, sure. Um, what, uh, where is the highest density of people found? Probably not Siberia. So let's go do that. Um, Cody, what you got? Uh, B. Uh, B, so in temperate or tropical biomes, sure. Um, an A structure diagram shaped like a pyramid. <laughs> and a pyramid shaped like a pyramid. Um, <laughs> it shows what's happening with the population. Aaron, what you got? Uh, yeah, sure. Pre industrial societies tend to have higher growth rates because 
Jordan, pick two again. Yeah, children, um, wait, which one? B, you said be like boy, right? Oh, okay, good. Um, there is little opportunity for women to get an education or employment. So what happens during the transitional stage, um, the demographic transition? Um, what say you, Scala? Yeah, so high birth rates with low death rates, and the population is going to increase. Sure, so we should all feel pretty good about that. According to this age pyramid, um, Nigeria's future population will be... He picking the same person that's not here. It's pretty funny. Ezra, what you got? Uh, much yeah, much larger. Something smart, larger, much larger. Um, and so, according to these graphs, which countries had access to family planning? I'll give you a second to look at this. I don't know if you got to it earlier. What you got, tracking? Yeah, so Kenya and Bangladesh, and so you can see that um, the TFR in Kenya and Bangladesh was dropped, both dropped a lot. All right, cool. So um, what you can do now is you can look back over your population math if it's not finished, or you can look at your FRQs and let me know if you have any questions.